Well, it's a little bit different, isn't it? I ask you to read with me Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. Jen jumped across to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, for a very good reason, of course. Now, let's firstly start, and we're going to be talking tonight. I mean, our talks have been about the book of Revelation, about the witnesses, and our last study, we got to the French Revolution and to the time period that ushered in the sixth vial and we're living in the end of the sixth vial period now so we're talking about our very time period a time of trouble such as never was so if we're in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18 and we just look at those words for example the earlier part as I said was about the witnesses and then at the end of that chapter you've got this vision of the kingdom but prior to that kingdom being established we're given some details of what will be happening in the nations and we read that in verse 18 and the nations were angry and of course that's very true of the nations today isn't it in fact if we just look at the, the screen and i've got the words on the screen and i've highlighted them differently differently because there's a very close comparison and it appears to me even though God gave to the Lord Jesus Christ to give to us the book of Revelation, that verse 18 really is a citation from Daniel chapter 12 and verses 1 through 4. And I'll show you what I mean. That's why I've coloured these verses here. It starts in Revelation 11 and verse 17. Thou hast taken unto thee great, great power. And if we compare that and, and then it says, and the nations were angry. The word angry, as you can see, means exacerbated. Ex, 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 they're, they're, they're bewildered. They've got no way to turn. They're, they don't know what the solution to the problem is. And if we compare that with Daniel chapter 12, we find that the words are very similar. At that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince which standeth for the children of thy people and then in Revelation it says the nations were angry but Daniel says at that time it shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation and we're going to open that up and we're going to look at that tonight and just see how how does that affect us are we going to be impacted by that well I can't tell you in detail for sure but we can look at what the scriptures say about the time that time period, a time of trouble such as never was. And then the quotation in Daniel in verse 4 finishes and it talks about the resurrection. And many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and contempt, as it says in Daniel 12 verse 4. And of course that's lined up with Revelation chapter 11. You can see the words in blue there. And the time of the dead that they should be judged, just the time of the resurrection, same time period. Nations are angry, time of trouble, same time period. Even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, says Daniel, everyone that shall be found written in the book, and they shall shine as the stars forever and ever. And Revelation says, at that time that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. So, to me, there's a very close citation from, De from Daniel chapter 11, chapter 12, in Revelation chapter 11. So they're both talking about the same time period. So it's a good lead in for us. We've been dealing with the book of Revelation, but now we're going to look at this quotation. Let's go back now, go across to Daniel chapter 12 and just see what that's talking about. It says there will be a time of trouble such there as never was. Now look, we look at the world, we look out on the world today, we're very fortunate in Australia. We're very blessed that we can meet like this, we can move around. America is quite different, Great Britain is quite different, and Europe is quite different. Nations are struggling. So maybe we're approaching a time of trouble such as never was. Now, but before I talk about that, I'm just going to have a little bit of a discussion about COVID. Not much, 
just a little bit, a, a little bit that might just help us understand a bit. Now it's been fittingly called the Corona virus because the name, as the name refers, it has the appearance of a solar corona. So when we get an eclipse of, of the sun, you get this characteristic appearance around the outside of the sun, which the virus has also got that appearance of these these uh, projecting bulbous uh, on the side of the virus. So it looks like a corona. So they've called it a coronavirus after the corona of the sun or a corona of the sun. The solar corona is the aura of plasma that surrounds the sun and is most easily seen during a total eclipse. But the word comes, the word corona comes from the Latin word for crown, which means a wreath, and the Greek equivalent of the word wreath is a stephanos. And it's interesting that stephanos is used in scripture, uh, of, it symbolizes uh, the wearer of, of, of a, given to a, a person who is victorious in the games, a victor, to wear on their heads, they wear a laurel on their heads, so it's a crown or a stephanos. So we see an image there of what a stephanos might look like, or a corona, or coronal wreath. So it's placed on the heads of the victors in the ancient Greek games to commemorate their victory. Here, the victory in the world today is in a contest with mankind against a tiny, the tiniest organism, a small virus that can only be seen through an electron microscope. And yet, it's brought the world to its knees. Man can't even see it with his naked eye. And yet, this little thing that God has created for a purpose can bring man to his knees. And so, so much for man's strength and man's wisdom. God can just do whatever he likes and control the nations with just a simple little virus. Now, why is it called COVID-19. Well, there's a committee, an international committee, that gives the names to viruses, it's called a taxonomy of viruses, who give official name to viruses, and it's made up of the words, the letters CO for corona, BI for virus, D for disease, and in the year 19, when it was first found in China, so we've got COVID, it's not called so much the coronavirus, now it's called COVID-19, but it's the same thing. That's all I'm going to say about that, because there has been lots of epidemics and pandemics that have affected the world. Let's have a look at a passage in Luke 21, just to get started. We are going to come back to Daniel. Luke 21. Now, Luke 21 is all about the days of AD 70. We know that. No, but Bible footprint also has got a latter-day application. A lot of prophecies have a historical footprint and then a latter-day application. So when we come to read, for example, the words in verse 10, Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. So the scriptures are telling us that, yes, God would send pestilences, and if this footprint is true to the footprints of the rest of Bible prophecy, it has got a latter-day application. And so the word pestilences means a disease. The word pestilence in the English dictionary means a fatal epidemic or a fatal pandemic. And that's what we're faced with at the moment. And of course, there has been many pandemics. There's been the Spanish flu, there's been the Black Death. We're probably aware of all the pandemics, but the world is faced with one at the moment and it doesn't know the answer. But we do know the answer. We know that we're living on the edge of a time of trouble such as never was. Now, it says there in, in Luke 21 and verse 11 that these things are from heaven. Ezekiel tells us when he talks about God sending plagues and sword and wild beasts against the nations of sin and against the nation of Israel, that it comes from God. So these pestilences, what's happening in the world, 
is as direct action from God because of the way the world is conducting itself. But it's not just the virus that's affected. The, the virus is affecting the world as we can see on the screen in a whole range of other ways. Economic, political and military impacts. And we're all aware of what's happening with Australia and China at the moment. It, it looks like that China is trying to provoke Australia in some sort of war game, maybe out of the Pacific. It looks like Russia is backing China. It certainly appears that, that Russia now wants to move into Afghanistan because Australia has fallen out of grace in Afghanistan with events that have happened now with our SS troops in that country. So the world is changing quite quickly and the box of countries that we used to know are now being moved and we are finding we have to align ourselves with Britain and with America more closely, who knows what's going to eventually happen with America. So yes, there's a virus out there in the world, but there's lots of other changes. The economic shock, maybe it's not felt in Australia yet, but maybe it will be, but there's going to be lots of things that will come that will affect the world, and it's starting to affect the world in which we live now. But the big question is, what's going to be our position in relation to these events when it says, coming back now to Daniel chapter 12, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was. Where will we be at this time of trouble? When's it going to start? How long's it going to go for? I can't tell you exactly, but we do have the words here in Daniel chapter 12 and verse one that would happen at that time. At that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. At what time? We ask the question, well, what time is this? Well, the time it's referring to is a continuation from the words in Daniel chapter 11. Now, Brother Den, Ben has just been dealing with Daniel chapter 11. I don't think he's got to the end of the chapter yet. He's probably just halfway through the chapter. But we're talking about the end of Daniel chapter 11. It talks, it's referring to that time when the king of the south would push at the king of the north and come against him with chariots and great ships in the world. And we know that there has even been a typical fulfillment of that when Britain pushed Turkey out of the land of Israel. But we know that the king of the north yet has to come forth with great fury. So we're living in the time period that Daniel 11 is talking about is the time period in which we're living right before the time of trouble such as never was. The territory of the King of the North is starting to take shape. Iran, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria will all come under the domain control of the King of the North in some way undergo. And we see that unfolding, we see that happening. So we are living at this time. At that time, it says, shall Michael stand up. Now, who is Michael? At that time shall Michael stand up. Now, Michael is not the angel Michael, but it's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ who will take over the work of the angels. Michael, the great prince, in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, is the Lord Jesus Christ. The name Michael means who like Christ. God and the Lord Jesus Christ is the exact representation, he's the manifestation of his Father. And we, it tells us that he, he's not seated now beside the right hand of God, it says, but he's standing up. The Lord Jesus Christ is standing up, the great Prince, ready to do something. This is happening at the time of the end. Russia, the King of the North, making its move, and the great Prince, the Lord Jesus Christ, is now standing up and he's getting ready to move. At that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince, he says, which standeth for the children of thy people. Who's the children of thy people? Well, it's natural Israel and it's spiritual Israel. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come to bring redemption to the household. He's going to come to bring eventually salvation to the house, to the natural house of Israel. They'll have to accept him. Be the tents of Judah that are saved first, and then eventually Israel in dispersion will be gathered. So he has come for the children of thy people. And then it says, then it says, 
there shall be a time of trouble such as never was. Now I've said to you that Michael is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul interprets that for us. He actually draws from this chapter and this verse and come hold your hand in Daniel chapter 12 and come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We know, we know the words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but it is a reference to the words in Daniel chapter 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, and that's speaking about us, we are the ones that are alive right at the end time period, shall not prevent, and the word is proceed, we will not proceed them which are asleep. The resurrection will occur, occur first before we are taken away. For the Lord himself shall descend from them. You see, Paul's interpreting Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. He's saying, Michael, who stands up, and for the, for the children, the great prince, and stands up for the children of my people, he says here in verse 16, is the Lord himself. He shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And of course we know those words in Daniel 12 verse 3. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall rise, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and contempt. So at the same time period, Michael's going to stand up at that time. And we're living right on the edge of that time now. Verse 17, Then we which are alive, that's us, and remain, shall be caught up together with them in, not the clouds, but in clouds. So a multitudinous body of people caught up together and taken away to meet the Lord in the political air, not in the sky, but to be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so he says, Wherefore, verse 18, comfort one another with these words. At this time of trouble that's coming upon us in the household, we can find comfort. We're right on the edge of it. We see it starting to happen, but we can comfort one another with these words. So as I said, this verse is interpreted by Paul as Michael is the Lord himself. And so when it says there in Thessalonians, he shall come from heaven with a shout. The word shout is used in the Septuagint version in Proverbs of locusts responding to a, an unheard sound, but they respond to a command which only they can hear, no one else can hear it. And it's the same word that's, that's used of the, of the saints. We will hear the word that the Lord Jesus Christ has come. Nobody else in the world will hear it. We are looking for it. So the great shout is not a shout that everybody hears. It's a shout that those hear that are looking and waiting and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now it could be, we don't know, this, it could be that when Christ died and rose, when he died, this great earthquake and graves were opened in the city. When he came forth from the grave, others then came out of the grave and went into the city and presented themselves in the city. It's possible that at the resurrection, which will occur first before we are taken away, that a saint who is asleep that we have known will come and knock on our door and we will know the resurrection has taken place and we will be taken with that saint, that resurrected saint and the angel to the place of judgment. And we're to comfort one another with these words. So only this word is only heard by those who look for it. Only those that are in the memorial graves, as it says in John 5, will hear this sound. It says in John chapter 5, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves. Now you would read that and you think, well, it says everybody. But the word graves, as you can see on the screen, means memorial graves. Only those that are in the memorial graves shall hear his voice. They'll hear this shout, and they will come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation. And 
So Paul concludes that quote there in Thessalonians. He says, look, these are there. These words are here. They're here for words of comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. They're comforting because when we link them up with Daniel chapter 12, we see the world will be terrible. It's going to be a terrible time. But he's telling us that we will be saved out of that, whether we are on the edge of it, we will feel some of the impacts, but we, as it says in Daniel 12, he will stand up for the children of his people. At that time, Daniel says, at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So the company words, it tells us that we will be delivered from it, even though we don't know what's going to exactly happen in the world. So Paul includes in this quote from Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, the words concerning the resurrection. And I've already quoted that a number of times already tonight. Many that sleep in the dust of the earth should be raised. Paul includes those words. And so he says, coming now, Daniel says, coming now back to Daniel chapter 12. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. For there is going to be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So great is trouble going to be that's going to be brought upon the world that it will never have been experienced since there was a nation on the earth. Now that excludes the flood. The flood was a terrible time. So it's not saying that the flood was not a terrible time. The flood was a terrible time. But these are words are from the time of the flood. God had said that he would never destroy the earth again with the flood. But he's saying that he's going to bring a time of trouble upon the earth that will be different to the flood. The flood was terrible. But this time we're coming to, approaching to now, is going to be a terrible time. Now there are two other references to a time of trouble in our Bibles. They're in Jeremiah, we won't turn to them, in Matthew, but they're, they're referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. Now that's the time for trouble for the nation of Israel. They're 40 years regathering. The time when they go, will go through a terrible turmoil, being led by Elijah. It's not referring to that time. It's re this is referring, the time of trouble is referring to the Gentile world. And we're going to be saved out of that. That's a difference. Since there was a nation, it says. And when it says, since there was a nation, that connects us with Genesis chapter 10. Because prior to Genesis chapter 10, we have no nations in the Bible. As you can see in verse 5 of Genesis chapter 10, it says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles, or the word Gentiles is nations, or goyim, we get the word goyim from it, Gentiles. By these were the isles of the nations divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families in their nation. The nations, the, the races became nations after the flood. So when it says there's a time of trouble since there was a nation, it's saying since the flood. And we haven't experienced anything like the going to experience, or the world's going to experience. A terrible time of trouble since there was a nation. But at that time, Daniel says, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now, Jeremiah and Isaiah offered words of comfort to us about this time. Just come across to uh, Isaiah 26, for example. But it talks about this terrible time and the time of the resurrection. Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26 verse 1 says, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for the walls of our bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Now here, as this, this chapter opens up with a vision of Christ in the kingdom, but then it goes on to describe the details of what the earth will be like before that. And it, it gives us words of comfort in verse 3. It says, 
Thou wilt keep him or her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust in Yahweh forever for in Yah Yahweh is everlasting strength. So you've got these words of encouragement here in, in Isaiah 26 before it then starts to go into what will actually happen to the world. Now it says here in Isaiah 26 over in the end of the chapter it talks about the resurrection. For example, it talks about the time of trouble in verse 9. For with my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. God's judgments will be brought in this time of trouble, and the world will eventually learn righteousness. But before that happens, the resurrection of the saints must occur. And so we read in verse 19, Thy dead men shall live. Verse 19. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise, awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for the dew, thy dew as the, as the dew of the herbs. And the earth shall cast out her dead. Come, my people. So this is the verse that's talking about verse 19, about the resurrection. If you look on the screen I've got here, I've crossed out the words that are not in the original. It's a reference to the resurrection of the multitudinous body, the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. My dead, not men, my dead shall live. My dead body shall arise. The dead body of the multitudinous saints, those, those that have been lying in the grave since Adam, along with those that are alive, will be caught together, as it says in Thessalonians. And they shall arise, arise and see, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast forth thy dead. Then he says, at the resurrection, then come my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself as it were for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, Yahweh cometh out of his place, to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, the earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover the slain. So it's saying there'll be, this, there'll be the resurrection and then there'll be a time where the, the saints, the bride of Christ, are taken away to a chamber and they will be protected from the time of trouble and the doors will be closed behind them. They will be protected. So they're worth, like the words in Thessalonians, they are words of comfort. Words of comfort. So it says in that verse 20, shut thy doors, and I've highlighted the word, shut thy doors about thee. Brown driver and Briggs say that should be translated. Let the doors be shut. Now I've got a picture of the ark there because that's what happened. God took Noah into the ark, the world was destroyed, and he closed the door of the ark. So God will take us away, he will close the doors of the world, and we will be kept safe. Yahweh shut Noah in. The angels grabbed Lot and pulled him into the door, and they closed the door on the people who were trying, they shut them out. The nation of Israel was taken out into the wilderness, and it says they were shut up in the wilderness. And God's going to do the same for us, he's going to protect us, he's going to close the door against the time of trouble. And the word shut means to shut so as to exclude, that we will be excluded from that that's going on in the world. But it's conditional, you see, because now coming back to Daniel chapter 12. Just come back to Daniel chapter 12. Because you see it says there in verse 1, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So those that are found written in the book are going to be delivered. Now there's two books mentioned in the Bible. Now this has been used a bit lately, and I believe it's been used incorrectly. 
There's two books. It says the books are open. We've got two books. One's called A Scroll of the Life, and the other one is called The Scroll of Life. It's their brother Thomas's translation of the words. Now, A Scroll of the Life is a kind of day book in which everyday life of the saints are recorded, and it's called the Book of Remembrance. We know the words in Malachi, those that spoke often one to another, a book of remembrance was written of them. So, brothers and sisters, a book of remembrance is recorded of our daily lives, of what we've done. The other book, the other book, the scroll of life, is a record of those who will enter into eternal life. The names are recorded at baptism, but they can be blotted out. So we understand, yes, the book of life, at, at baptism, our names are written in there. That is not a ticket to the kingdom. Now sometimes it is used that way. It says, well, okay, you're baptised, that's it. It doesn't matter what you do. That's not what the scriptures are teaching. The scriptures are saying there's two books. It's a book of remembrance. And the two books will be opened and we will be judged out of the books. Now not that we're, our works are going to save us, we're going to be saved by grace. But there has to be attempts, there has to be a desire to do what God wants. If we are willfully lawless, rebellious, and we've got our names written in the book of life, well, it's going to be blotted out. If we rebel against God, it's not going to stay there. So there are two books, and it's conditional, conditional upon how we try to live our lives. We're going to be saved by grace, none of the works we perform. But we're not simply saved because our names are written in the book of life. I think we need to remember that. And that's what the scriptures are saying. Everyone that shall be found written in the book, those that are found worthy, as the scriptures say, they will be saved from that time of trouble such as never was. It says that like, people will be delivered. But those whose names have been blotted out, well, the scriptures indicate to us that they will be cast out into the lake of fire, which is Europe in a time of trouble. They'll be cast out into this time of trouble. It will be terrible for them. And so it seems that the faithful was, will be saved out of the time of trouble based on the scriptural experiences of Noah and his family. Noah and his family kept themselves separate from the world. Lot and some of his family tried to keep themselves separate from the world. And those in the city of Jerusalem who fled at the warning of the Lord Jesus Christ were saved from the events of AD 70. And we will be saved if we try to do something about keeping ourselves as the bride of Christ. Not if we just say, look, I'm baptised, it's all okay, I can do what I like. Now, just a little bit of a diversion, because I just want to have a, a closer look at what the scriptures say about this time of trouble. Now, we've got to go to Isaiah 24 for that. Now, Isaiah 24 is all about the nation of Israel, God's judgments on the nation of Israel. But as I've said already, there is a historical footprint, then there is the latter-day application of this footprint. Isaiah 24, yes, it's about what would happen to the nation of Israel because of their rebellion against God. But Isaiah 24 is also a picture of what is going to happen to the world just prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Because you see, it ends with the words, verse 23, then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when Yahweh of armies shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. So it ends with a picture in the kingdom. The time period projects us right to the end of days. Now, this is what Brother Carter says. Brother Carter says, this chapter outlines the future calamities of Israel, but in its broader setting also foretells the end of the Gentile world and the general confusion that prevails when the end of the kingdom of men arrives. And that's in... Uh, the prophecy of Isaiah, if anybody wants that set of notes, they can come and see me afterwards. 
because it's not in a book form and I can email you those set of notes by John Carter which are on the prophecy of Isaiah very interesting said and there's that quote so it's it's dealing with when the Lord Jesus Christ comes so what does it say what does it say about the world well here we are in verse 2 Isaiah 24 and verse 2 and it shall be as with the people so with the priest as with the servant so with his master as with the maid so with her mistress as with the buyer so with the seller as with the lender so with the borrower as with the taker of usury so with the giver of usury to him and so as you can see on the screen this judgment is going to affect everybody in the world god is no respecter of persons priests and people master and servant mistress and maid buyer and seller the whole world is going to be as it's being affected now everybody's being affected in some way and this time of trouble everybody will be affected it doesn't matter what their position is it goes on to say in verse 3 that the land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled for Yahweh has spoken this word the earth is going to be completely spoiled Yahweh has spoken this judgment verse 4 it says the earth mourneth and fadeth away the world languisheth and fadeth away the haughty people of the earth do languish you know the proud people and the world's full of proud and haughty people it goes on to say that they were breakers of the everlasting covenant in verse 5 the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws changed the ordinances broken the everlasting covenant so it's the time period of the last days the words we know so well from second timothy 3 know this also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful unholy without natural affection truce breakers false accusers incontinent fierce despisers of those that are good traitors heady high-minded lovers of pleasures more than lovers of god having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away that's what it's going to be like in the last day and that's what isaiah is saying the earth is going to be full of these people and it truly is it says in revelation the nations are angry and they are angry today and they've turned away from the everlasting covenant the everlasting covenant is the promise of salvation in christ now if you talk to christians out there oh they say well, we believe in christ but they don't understand christ the true christ of the bible they don't understand the covenant that the lord jesus christ has made on our, on our behalf and so it says in verse 6 therefore hath the curse devoured the earth and they that dwell therein are desolate therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left now the pocket can anybody tell me what the population of the earth is saying it's saying and i'm not a, it says the slain of the lord shall be from one end of the earth to the other few men shall be left it's going to be terrible it was terrible in the flood but it's going to be terrible for the world a time of trouble such as never was jeremiah says thus saith yahweh of armies behold evil shall go forth from nation to nation and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth and the slain of the lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth they shall not be lamented neither gathered nor buried they shall be as waste upon the ground people won't even be able to cry for anybody because death will be so common it'll be so terrible now as christadelphians we don't relish talking about this but God has presented us with his word. He's presented the Bible to the world. But the world has rejected it. God is only giving the world what they want. As you sow, so shall you reap. The world wants eternal death. They will get eternal death. We want eternal life. We turn to the scriptures and we try to do that which is right. God will reward us with eternal life. 
as we sow, so we shall reap. The world sows to the flesh, it will reap of the flesh. It's a principle, it's a, it's a scriptural law. The world will be so miserable that even mourning will seem out of place. Then it goes on to say from verses 6 through to 11, the new wine mourneth, the vine languisheth, all the merry hearted do sigh. All those people that, that were drinking the Australian wine and they've got no market for any more, they're, they're up, they, they can't sell their wine. The Chinese won't be, they'll be getting it from some other place. People in Australia that just live or drink beer and wine and alcohol. The mirth, verse 8, the mirth of the tabrets, music shall cease, the noise of them that rejoice endeth, the joy of the harp, all the lovers that go to the concerts, the music concerts, that will cease. And of course what is played in many places today isn't really music, it's just horrible noise. All that will cease. They shall not drink wine with a song, strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. The city of confusion is broken down, every house is shut up, that so no man will come in. And that's started to happen already, just a little bit with the pandemic. All these houses of pleasure have had to close their doors because people can't go there because they're afraid of getting COVID-19. But it's going to get worse. People that look for comfort and joy will not find it in the world. But then it says, verse 13, When thus it shall be in the midst of the land amongst the people, shall, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree and as the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. So it's saying there's going to be a little remnant of people. And perhaps this is speaking of us. The world's in a terrible state already, but there's going to be like you go out to harvest an olive tree and most of the olives have been picked off. But to get the final few that are left, I think they hit it with a stick or they, as it says, they shake the olive tree for those that are left. And where we are those, we are the remnant that are left. There shall be a shaking of the olive tree and a gleaning of the grapes. And the, the vintage is finished. The grapes have been gleaned, but there's a few left. And that's the few small Christadelphians, 50,000 Christadelphians in the world. And they will be gleaned. They shall lift up their voice, verse 14. They shall sing for the majesty of Yahweh. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore glorify ye Yahweh in the fires, even the name of Yahweh, God of Israel, in the isles of the sea. So we're now... Isaiah's turned from a horrible vision to a little vision of hope. There will be a remnant in the earth in this terrible time. And I believe it's talking about Christadelphians, about the saints. A remnant who will praise God. It says the islands, verse 15, wherefore glorify ye Yahweh in the fires and the fires, and I think I've got it on the screen here. There it is, the fires is a reference to the regions of light. And the regions of light is where the, where the Word of God is. Now, if you went to South America, you probably wouldn't find much light of the Word of God. If you went to Spain or Portugal, you probably wouldn't find much light of the Word of God. But if you went to the Isles, maybe to New Zealand or to Australia, you would find some light of the Word of God in this dark world. And I believe it's a reference to that. So the island powers will be involved in this Praise to God. Verse 16, from the uttermost part of the earth have we heard their songs, their praise. From a long, long way away, Australia is from Israel. There have been these people, there will be these people who will praise God, even glory to the righteous. But I said, my leanness, my leanness, woe unto me, the treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously, yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt, dealt very treacherously. Even though there will be some people who are trying to do the right thing and praise God, the world will go on and it will deal treacherously. It will still be a very treacherous place. And so they will be from the uttermost parts of the earth and they will praise the righteous one, which is a reference to the saints praising God. But now Isaiah turns back now to the, how bad the world will be again. And so he says this in verse 17. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth, and it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of fear shall fall into the pit, 
and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. Not that it's going to be a flood like it was in the days of Noah, but the language is the language of the judgment day that came in the day of the flood. It's going to be a similar judgment upon the earth. Verse 19, the earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. So everything that man has got organised in the world and relies upon is going to be turned upside down. It's going to be, as the scriptures tell us, a time of trouble such as never was. And so Luke tells us, or the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in Luke, we need to be very, very careful in that day. He says, take heed to yourselves, lest any of you turn and at any time your hearts be overcharged with serpenting. Now, serpenting means you know, just participation, uh, wild parties going out and engaging in fellowship with the things of the world, drunkenness. And we would hate to think that Christadelphians get drunk, but I've heard of that. But the drunkenness here is referring to becoming intoxicated with the ways of the world. Our ecclesias, our ecclesial ways can become intoxicated with the ways of the world. Our spiritual lives can become intoxicated. The Lord Jesus Christ saying, be very careful that you don't become affected by the world because that day will come upon you unawares. Even though we've been talking about it, even though as Christadelphians we know it's going to happen, it says as a snare, as it said in Jeremiah and in Isaiah 24, as a snare shall it come on them that dwell on the face of the earth. It's going to trap them. They will not be expecting it. They're going to be trapped in this situation. And then we've got the parable of the ten virgins, haven't we? Noah and Lot of the saints of Jerusalem. There was a warning to remove themselves from that evil world. And we have to do that as much as possible. Now we all know the parable of the ten virgins. And we have to keep our lamps trimmed and keep oil in our lamps. And the ten virgins represent the ecclesial world. But five of the virgins, five of the virgins, let their oil run out. And even the virgins that had oil in their lamps, well, they were asleep. They were caught unexpectedly. It's a great warning to us. We might think that we're spiritual. We might think that we're ready and coming at the Lord, but it could be, brothers and sisters, that we might be caught up in so many things that we will not be aware of his coming. So we need to be very, very careful. Because it says, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered, they all slumbered and they all slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, going out to meet him. So we need to make sure, even though the world's terrible and it's going to get a lot worse, that we will go out be ready to meet the Lord in that day. Now we started our talk by saying we're going to be right on the edge of this time of trouble. Now I'm just going to use a little example to maybe strengthen that idea a bit more. We go right back to the plagues of Egypt. So the scriptures do not say that we will necessarily be saved out of all of the troubles as, the, as Israel were not necessarily saved out of all the plagues that come upon Egypt. There were ten plagues but Israel were not excluded from them all. Israel felt the first three plagues. I can ask the children, I can ask somebody, what were the first three plagues that impacted upon Israel in the land of Goshen? Blood to water, that's right, blood to water. Next one. It's a really relevant one for today, too. Did I see somebody with a frog here last time I was here? Did somebody say frogs? Yes. The plague of frogs. And what was the next plague? The plague of lice. So there were three plagues that afflicted Israel. Now, it's, we could probably try and make spiritual lessons out of them, and that might be a little bit of license. But it's interesting, you could say, well, the water turned to blood, we've got the water of life here, but maybe it's we're making a mess of it today, and 
the household is doing all sorts, they're destroying it, it's turning it to blood. We've got frogs that are affecting us today, the frog-like spirits that have come from the French Revolution. They're finding their way into the ecclesial world, fraternity, liberty, equality. Everyone should make there's, there's no respect or honour in the ecclesial environment anymore. It's the frog-like spirits of the world. So that's affecting us. The lice, I mean, they're, they're irritating. They're very irritating. And we've got all sorts of things in the ecclesial world that irritate us today. So, that, you know, there are things that are affecting us, but, but they're going to get... And there were things that affected Israel. But then the seven remaining plagues, Israel were saved out of them. They have kept separate in the land of Goshen. So maybe it's suggesting to us as that we will feel some of the time of trouble such as it never was. But then when it really comes, we will be saved out of it. That's as long as we're ready and our names are written, not only in the book of life, but in the book of remembrance. So we need to remember those things. And so there's going to be, there is really one last dreadful plague, which is the final one for everybody, really, which is death. Even for Christadelphians, those who reject, who are rejected, they will suffer that from the plague too, the, the plague of death, the Passover plague. We must be under the effect of blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It must be on the doorposts of our house. The principles of the sacrifice of Christ, our lives must be under that shadow of sacrifice for one another, sacrifice for God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to keep our loins girded, our staff and I have to be ready for that call that might come at midnight because the world certainly won't be ready. And some of the saints won't be ready. We need to be ready. Of course, we know the words. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am Yahweh. And of course, Yahweh's going to do that. He's going to execute judgment against all the gods of this world. And death will come to many people. But we need to make sure that, that final death does not take us. So then, brethren, sisters, and young people, we can say in summary, well, is COVID-19 a precursor to the time of trouble? Well, it could be. We're certainly seeing lots of troubles in the world today that are developing from that. We see the world is going to be affected by the economic impacts, by the political impacts, by the military impacts and the consequences of COVID. We see that there is going to be a time of trouble such that there was ever a nation, a terrible time, never experienced on the earth before. Then Michael, the great prince, the Lord Jesus Christ, will stand up for the children of his people. And we've got the comforting words that come with the words of resurrection. But at that time when the resurrection occurs, that we will be taken a way to be with the saints. But then we've got Isaiah's gloomy picture of that time of trouble. The world will be turned upside down. Men shall be slain from one end of the earth to the other. We've seen Israel's relationship to the plagues and possible association with us that we may be impacted by some of the time of trouble such as never was. And we are to be found ready, our loins girded, and time when that great last plague will come, that we might be saved out of death. Let us then, brethren and sisters, make it our vow, if you like, that we will remain constant, true to the truth, no matter what happens, even though the days are here. Thank you.